Hey, everybody. Welcome to the virtual edition of Federal Student Loan Exit Counseling offered by the Hollins University Financial Aid Office. All right. If you're thinking to yourself, why am I here? <laughs> why do I need to complete exit counseling? Well, either you are graduating, congratulations, or you're dropping below half-time enrollment. So maybe you're completing your thesis or just taking one class, or you're experiencing a break in attendance. For all of those reasons, the government wants you to complete loan exit counseling. That's because when you were in school at least half-time enrollment, you had an in-school deferment, and that postponed your student loan payments. Well, if your in-school deferment is ending, that means you're entering into a grace period, which is a transition period. So you don't have to make payments quite yet, but it's coming and repayment's going to be beginning soon. So the government wants you to have um, all this information about how your student loans behave so that you're empowered. So true story, <laughs> at a previous place that I used to work, I walked into our kitchen in our office and the toaster was on fire and it was pretty bad. It was kind of like this. <laughs> and my coworker, Janet, was just kind of standing there in shock, not moving. And my first gut reaction was to scream, Janet, <laughs> that didn't do anything. So then I, I cried for help for Joanne, uh, my coworker, because she had her act together. So Joanne ran in, she extinguished the fire. It was a whole thing. But Joanne was quite angry <laughs> because she's like, why did you call me? So the point of this story is sometimes in um, times when we're stressed out, we don't always react the way that we think we're going to react. So if you apply this to student loan repayment, if you're intimidated by your student loans and the bill that might be coming, you might kind of channel Janet where you ignore the loan <laughs> and subconsciously hope they go away. Uh, but we know that won't happen. Um, or you could be like me and we want somebody else to deal with this problem. <laughs> like, why can't the government forgive my loan? Where's Biden? Can't he uh, erase this loan? Um, that's really not healthy either. We just have to kind of grab the bull by the horns and deal with it. And someone like Joanne who took action, she may pay, but she might be bitter about it. And really it's not the loan's fault, they're innocent. <laughs> so our goals with student loan repayment should really be not to try to be anxious or intimidated. The whole point of the student loans was to help us afford college. It was a good thing, um, get us ahead. And so let's not have our head in the sand. It's okay to kind of look at the bills, look at the statements, um, ask questions when you're unsure, reach out to the companies that you're working with and ask for help, you know, it's okay. It's also a good goal to make a dent by paying as much as you can each month so that you can kind of get this loan over with and behind you. It took me 11 years to pay off my student loans and I was really glad when I finally did. It also really helped my credit score. So don't chisel away like in a small way, like the guy on the left, you know, really take a backhoe to these payments and try to pay as much as you can. Now, when we're talking about student loans, there's a bunch of different types of educational loans. So you might have a direct subsidized and or unsubsidized loan. And I have a little star next to it because that's what we're going to be talking about in this presentation for the most part. You might also have a private education loan from outside company or a federal Perkins loan, a graduate plus loan if you're a graduate student, um, a Holland's Hogue loan, which is an institutional loan or a parent may have a Parent PLUS loan. But for the purposes, like I said, of this presentation, we're going to be focusing on that very first one, the direct subsidized and or unsubsidized loan. That's because that's the standard federal student loan that we're all familiar with. It's the most common, graduate students and undergraduates qualify for it. And if you're wondering, well, what's the difference between subsidized and unsubsidized? Well, really it's just how the interest behaves. So in a subsidized loan, there's been no interest accruing while you're in school, which is really nice. But when you're repaying the loan from that point forward, there will be interest accruing, just like a traditional loan would. An unsubsidized loan is just a standard old loan. Interest has been accruing all along. So it's not that um, the subsidized loan is better than the unsubsidized loan. It's just that you've had an additional benefit that came with it for the period you were in school. The neat thing was that during the COVID emergency, the government paused the interest accruing on unsubsidized loans. So yay, for a little bit, you'll have a little bit of more of an interest benefit there. 
Now, actual loan exit counseling, you're gonna complete online at studentaid.gov. That's what the website looks like right now. And when you get there, if you notice on the top right, it says manage loans with a little drop down box. If you click that, you'll be able to see exit counseling and that's the page you'll get. Um, and you're gonna log in with the same user ID and password that you use for your FAFSA. And that'll give you all kinds of really great information about um, the federal student loans and your rights and responsibilities. Now, after you fill out your loan exit counseling online, you may be wondering, well, who am I gonna be working with? Like, who do I repay? Well, your loans are with the US Department of Education, but Uncle Sam likes to outsource the processing of the loans because it's just a lot of work. So they use various companies right now. They may assign you to somebody known as Maximus's Aid Vantage, or Nelnet, or Great Lakes, or Fed Loan Servicing, or Mohila, or Cornerstone, or Ed Financial. You get the picture, there's a bunch of different companies. The government will assign you to one of these. And sometimes, every once in a while, one of these companies says, you know what, we don't wanna do this anymore. And they may assign the loan to somebody else. So if you're ever unsure who you're supposed to be paying, reach out to your financial aid office. We can look that up for you and tell you. Look at these cute little ferrets. I'm using the ferrets to kind of um, stand in for student loans because they're cute <laughs> and less intimidating. Um, let's say you borrowed five different student loans. Um, in this example, this is typical for an undergraduate student, but same kind of thing applies to graduate students. Each loan has its own unique identity, just like the ferrets. So loan number one might be for $3,500, whereas loan number two is only $2,000. So they each might have different amounts. They might be different types. Some may be subsidized, some may be unsubsidized. They also may have different interest rates because the government changes interest rates each year. So for example, in 2020, 2021 academic year, undergraduate interest rates were only two and three quarter percent. And it was lower than it was in the years previous. Same with graduate students, their interest rates are different each year. So for 2020-21, the interest rates on student loans were 4.3 percent whereas years past, they were closer to six. But what's interesting is each loan's interest rate, even though it changes, it's fixed for the life of the loan. So loan number one, that little loan ferret, if it's a subsidized loan, it might have a 0% interest rate while that student is in school, and then in repayment, it might be 5.05%. Whereas loan number five, it's also a subsidized loan, but when it's in repayment, its interest rate might only be 2.75% because each interest rate is fixed for the life of the loan and unique to that particular year. So that's why each loan is very different. But like these ferrets, they're all kind of shoved together. <laughs> they're all bundled together. So when you go to make a payment, let's say you have to make a payment of $200 a month. What your servicing company will do is they'll give each ferret or each loan a little bit of that money. So they'll divide it up. So each loan is getting slowly paid off. Everybody gets a little bit of the pay, payment or the pie or whatever ferrets eat. <laughs> so if you're wondering, well, how much am I gonna have to pay on my subsidized and unsubsidized loans? Well, honestly, that depends on how much you borrowed because everybody borrows a different amount. Graduate students may also have undergraduate loans that they're still paying back. So it really depends on what your loan portfolio looks like. One piece of advice I might give you is when you know who your loan servicer is, like let's say you have Great Lakes or Nelnet, go ahead and create a user ID and password and log in to their portal so that you can see your loan portfolio. You might get those answers right away. Now the way the loans work is they have a floor, a minimum on the standard plan, which is 50 bucks a month. Your payment can't go lower than that on a standard plan. And if you're wondering, well, what's a standard plan? Well, what a standard plan is, is it takes what you owe and they figure out a 10-year repayment term so that every month it's the same amount for 10 years. So in this example, let's say somebody borrowed $27,000. Well, their payment might be about $250 or $285 a month every month for 10 years. It all depends on the interest rates on each of those loans because remember, the interest rates can vary quite a bit. Now, the good news is if you don't wanna pay that much um, each month, you can request 
an income-based repayment plan to lower your monthly payments. So right now, believe it or not, there's four different kinds of income-driven repayment plans or income-based repayment plans. And what's interesting, if you notice that far right column, is that the repayment term is not 10 years. In order to lower your payments, they have to extend out the repayment term. So uh, you're paying for longer than 10 years, but your monthly payments are a lot less. They may only be 10% of your discretionary income. So it can be lower than that 50 bucks a month. I personally recommend that you do the standard plan if you can afford it, because you'll pay the least amount in interest. But some people prefer the income-driven repayment plans, especially if they want to apply for loan forgiveness. So there are different options, and you'll learn more about that when you complete your loan exit counseling online. Another question besides, well, who am I paying and how much am I paying? You might say, well, when? When am I supposed to go into repayment? Well, each loan or each ferret <laughs> has its own six-month grace period. You get one. And once that six-month grace period is over, your loan goes into repayment. So um, for most people, if you go to school straight through, your loans will go into repayment six months after you stop attending college, at least half time. Now, for some of you, you've had longer than that because the government has paused student loan repayments during this COVID emergency. So we're going to have a bunch of people going into repayment at the end of January 2022. So it all depends. If you're graduating, um, let's say, in May of 2022, you might be going into repayment in November or December of 2022. So you can kind of get an idea. Again, if you're not sure, all you have to do is create a user ID and password for your loan servicing company's portal, log in, look at your loan portfolio, and it'll tell you, which is good. Now, let's say you're starting to pay back your loans and you're like, oh, I need to temporarily freeze my federal loan payments. I'm having problems. I can't afford it right now. Well, that's okay. There's different types there. If you notice the bullet points, there's in-school deferments. So if you go to graduate school or medical school or law school or something like that, you can get an in-school deferment again. There's unemployment deferments, economic hardship deferments. If you're in the Peace Corps or doing a graduate fellowship or you're in the military, you can get a deferment. There's even one for cancer treatment, although I hope you never need that one. Uh, just as a warning, interest does continue, continue to accrue on many loans, not subsidized loans or federal Perkins loans when you're in a deferment. But uh, just keep in mind that even though the payments might be frozen, sometimes your interest may not be, may be accruing. There's also something called a forbearance, and that's another way you can temporarily freeze your federal loan payments. But again, interest will continue to accrue. So let's say you're borrowing, you had a $30,000 loan balance and Let's just say all those loans, the interest rate was 6%, which it wouldn't be <laughs> because they're different every year, but we're just pretending for this example. If you had a forbearance for a year right after you entered in repayment, you would have had about $1,800 in interest accruing over the course of that year. So just notice that it can be good in the short term, but you are responsible for interest as it accrues. So use deferments and forbearances wisely. Sometimes it's better just to... Um, you know, work out with your servicer and talk to them on the phone and figure out what's the best way for you to get some temporarily, temporary relief and um, have the least financial impact from that. But forbearances are handy too. So if you can't qualify for a deferment, which is better, there are things for forbearance for general reasons. Uh, if you're an AmeriCorps, you're on National Guard duty, if you have a medical or dental internship or residency, if you're applying for teacher loan forgiveness, which I'll talk about in a little bit, or there's something called a loan debt burden where you're just, you have a large loan debt, um, you can ask for a forbearance. And sometimes you can even retroactively um, have it retroactively applied. So let's say you're three months past due by accident. You didn't realize that you were past due. You could always say, hey, can I have a general forbearance applied to my account? And can you start it from that first month that I was past due? Sometimes the servicers can help you with that, so just ask. Another good thing to know is that on your federal income taxes, you may be able to take a student loan interest deduction. You should probably read the instructions on the 1040 about that, but basically what it's meant to do is to help you deduct the amount of interest you paid on your federal student loans during the previous calendar year. 
So in the early years, you pay the most in interest um, when you're making your payments. So that can really be a very you know, nice help to you. If you want to get the um, 1098E, that's the tax form that tells you how much in interest you paid the year before, you're just going to download the information right off of your loan servicer's website each February. So that's something to just kind of file in the back of your mind. A lot of times loan servicers may send you an email and say, okay, your 1098E is ready for you to download. And you may say to yourself, what is that? <laughs> what are they emailing you this for? Or it might even just go in your junk mail folder of your email. So kind of file this away in your brain that there is such a thing as a student loan interest deduction. Now, if you're like me and you're like, can I cancel these loans? <laughs> There's different options for subsidized and unsubsidized loans. There's even some cancellation options for federal Perkins loans. Now, most of you do not have a federal Perkins loan, but I'm just throwing that out there for those of you who do. And if you wanna know about cancellation options for your loan, where the loan is actually canceled and wiped clean, as if you never had it, you should read your promissory note. And if you're not sure how to get that, just ask your financial aid person, we can help you. But there's something called public service loan forgiveness, where if you're working for a nonprofit, you may be able to uh, enroll in an income-based repayment plan and after 10 years um, have the rest of the balance forgiven. But again, you have to be working in a nonprofit and there's different um, you know, requirements for this public service loan forgiveness. So you will learn about it in your exit counseling, but also feel free to Google public service loan forgiveness to learn more. Your servicer would help you with that. Teachers, um, there is such a thing as partial teacher loan forgiveness for subsidized and unsubsidized loans. And again, it depends on where you're teaching, what you're teaching, when you're teaching, that kind of thing. Read your promissory note. Uh, for the federal Perkins loan, you can actually get um, a lot more loan forgiveness if you're a teacher or a librarian or things like that. Uh, Perkins loans also have forgiveness for people who participate in the Peace Corps. And God forbid, if you ever find yourself totally and permanently disabled where you're unable to work, you can apply for loan cancellation as well. Like I said, see your promissory note or notes for details, but you can also ask your friendly financial aid person and your loan servicer for help. So now that we've kind of gone through some of the basics, you might be wondering, well, what are my responsibilities as a borrower? Well, one of the most important is to keep your contact information updated with your servicer the company who's you know, managing your loans for you. So they need to know your address, your phone number, and your email address so they can reach you. Now, most companies will only reach out to you by mail uh, or email if you've signed up for email correspondence. It's very rare that your servicer will call you, so just be aware of scams because there are places that will call you pretending to you know, manage your student loan in order to try to get you to give them your social security number or things like that. So that's why it's really good to have a login to your portal or for you to make the phone call. <laughs> if you get a weird phone call, feel free to say, what, you know what? I'm gonna just call my servicer myself and not pick up. So that way um, you're keeping your contact information and your personal information private and secure. Another responsibility you should have is to make sure that you're making your student loan payment on time every month. It'll really help your credit score. Um, you don't wanna be late on your payments. If you're starting to find that you might be late on your payments or you can't afford it, well, that's when you should be applying for a deferment or an income-based repayment plan. Read your statements, look for any errors, make sure that they've applied your last payment, uh, everything that looks normal, nothing looks weird, and ask for any guidance or advice when you need it. Don't be shy, there's a lot of people waiting to help you. Definitely, please, do not default on your loans, for goodness sakes. Um, failure to repay for a certain number of months will mean you default. And that means the government will take your loan and uh, send it to a collection agency. And it's just really bad. There's some bad consequences for defaulting. It'll really hurt your credit score and you'll find it difficult to get credit for things like a new cell phone contract, utilities, a new loan, things like that. Uh, you'll rack up some late fees, uh, which will make the loan more expensive. And you'll also be sent to collections, possibly sued in court, and even wage garnishment is an option. They may withhold your income tax refund. So there's a lot of things that cascade down the line. If you are in default, there are ways that you can get out of default. It's not like the end of the world, but you really want to avoid it if you can. Now, I know we talked about the subsidized and unsubsidized loan. Um, just know that if you have a 
Perkins loan. <laughs> it's a federal loan as well. Very few of you do because the government got rid of this loan a few years ago. But if you do have a federal Perkins loan, your lender is actually Hollins University or the university that you attended. And we um, outsource the managing of our federal Perkins and Hollins Hope loan portfolios to a company called ECSI up in Pennsylvania. And their website is heartland.ecsi.net. So if you have a Perkins loan or a Hogue loan, you will be sending your payments and correspondence directly to ECSI. And so you'll wanna create a whole separate user ID and password for your heartland.ecsi.net account. And you would also, for federal Perkins loan borrowers, you would complete your exit counseling for the Perkins loan because it's different, has different terms, and it's a whole different kind of loan on their website as well. So here are some suggestions for you um, as we're kind of coming to a close with this little 20 minute presentation. First of all, you should create a monthly budget. Um, that can be painful for some people, but a budget is not meant to be um, a hard and fast rule. It's just meant to be a guide on where your money is going and to help you set goals and to help you feel in control of your money. You wanna know what you can afford to pay each month. And also create a five-year plan and some set some goals so that you set aside money for savings or things that are really important to you, whether that's saving up for a new vehicle, going on a vacation, um, updating your wardrobe, moving, any of those things. Educate yourself on financial management so that you're less intimidated. Try not to pay attention to what others are doing on social media because envy can make things difficult. If you're paying back your student loans and everybody you're following on social media seems to be having these great lives, you know, going on vacation, doing all this great stuff, Honestly, you have no idea if they're like major league in debt or if it's not really a, a lifestyle that they can afford. So don't, you know, torture yourself with <laughs> social media envy. And celebrate those little victories. Every month that you make a payment, keep track, have a countdown clock, uh, stuff like that. You know, it'll really make you feel good to know that you're making a dent and that you're making a difference. If you're looking for resources, there's a lot of great experts out there, like Susie Orman. She has a book, Young, Fabulous, and Broke. It's over a decade old, so it's a little bit outdated, but it's specifically meant for recent college graduates. She also has podcasts and YouTube videos that are helpful for financial freedom. Michelle Singletary writes a syndicated column called The Color of Money, which is really good. There's also a bunch of different podcasts like Farnoosh Tarabi's So Money. There's also even just regular magazines like Money Magazine that you can use to get more um, I guess more information about all kinds of things related to financial management and financial literacy. And if you wanna learn more about budgeting or all the different ways you can budget, I mean, just go to YouTube and like I did here, I just Googled budgeting for beginners. Well, I didn't Google it, I YouTube searched it. <laughs> and I got this really good video, uh, how to budget monthly for beginners, a step-by-step -step guide. Um, Bukola even has a free budget template. So there's a lot of different um, types of resources out there to help you get through the whole student loan repayment process. If you have any questions, please just ask your friendly neighborhood financial aid person or your loan servicer for help. We'd be happy to help you and good luck and um, on to the next thing.